Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Welcome back to the channel, I'm Hank Strange. Today we're going to do another How It's Made with my buddy Sam Andrews. Welcome back, Sam. Good to have you here. How's it going? What are we making today? Today we're going to be doing one of the McDaniel 2s. That's the inside the waistband holster. By sheer numbers made, it's the most popular rig I do. Right, thousands and thousands of them. Yeah, everyone wants to, well, most people want to be concealed, right? Oh, it's the easiest to conceal. Okay. Is this, uh, is this your monthly production here this on the table? This is part of my part monthly of production run. This is kind of the tail end as they're all getting dried and ready for color. Amazing. A lot uh, of work. So this, this, is this is one of the McDaniel holsters. Okay. They have a lot of features people like. They have the steel reinforced top. They have the torque plate to pull the butt of the gun in. The belt loop when it's mounted on can be swiveled in different angles or changed for size. Year, years of trial and error. Yeah, so <laughs> a lot of technology, science, <laughs> engineering, and art going into it. We're going to make two of them today, right? Right. We're going to do one production style. This is for things I make a lot of the same thing. We have dies to cut them. They go very quickly. Then we'll do one by hand, which is if I had a custom order, the way I would be building it. Okay, what guns are we doing? We're doing a SIG 226 okay, very and nice. your very popular new Glock 43. SIG 226 and Glock 43. Let's do it. This is for the Glock 43, which as yet I have no dies for. I'm building these by hand. So we lay it down where we're going to trace out the pattern. And since this is a rough out holster, I check the back to make sure there's no scars or holes or anything that would detract from its good looks. Trace out the pattern. Mark the hole. And then the method of cutting that I've developed uses an old rag of carpet behind the leather, which allows me to put the blade through cutting edge away from me, point first, and using short sawing motions, it makes it so much easier you can cut through in one go. You don't have to keep dragging the knife over the same point, and it's also easier when you're trying to make a corner, you can just shorten up the little sawing motions and gain the steering control, which is so hard to do when you're trying to draw the knife toward you. Once you get practiced at this style of cutting, you can literally bisect the pen line. It's very, very exact and much easier than the old head knife style that was taught for centuries. And out we come. And it gives you a very clean edge. I'm going to do the same thing for the body shield. This is the top of the holster. But on this, I'm cutting it out of a very dense 12 ounce leather that the good people at Wicked and Craig split for me. It's thicker, very tough, and it's got a tightly bonded fiber structure so it makes a stiff shield oh, okay. to go between me and the metal of the gun. Okay, because this to me looks a lot like the other piece of leather. I was wondering if there was a difference, yes. and there is. Right, thickness and tensile strength, if you will. Okay. So this is where a lot of the action is going to be taking place with the draw? Right. This okay. is what covers up the steel reinforcement around the top of the holster okay. and has the extension that acts as a shield between the person wearing it and the metal parts of the firearm. It's a little tougher to cut, being a harder leather and thick as well. Yeah, you can see there's definitely... There's a little more oomph. It's not going through like butter. Nope. <laughs> and for tight little inside corners, I use the, the narrower X-Acto blade, but for general cutting, the medium angle blade works the best. And these X-Actos, are they specifically for leather, or this is just no, what you get in a standard X-Acto kit? Just the X-Acto knives you'd get at the hobby store. Very but good. It's what I learned to cut with, and I never saw a need to change. As you can see, it is a thicker, denser piece of leather for yeah. the shield and the top. Yeah, there's a difference in the grain, it looks like, almost. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, this is going to go on on the rough side of the body, so that when it's finished, 
The smooth interior is against my gun for less friction, easier movement, and the rough outside helps grab between the shirt and the pants so it doesn't want to slide around. That was the hand cutting method, which I do for the custom work. Now we'll move over here to the clicker press and use the die cutting. The clicker is a hydraulic cutting press. It's got a cutting board surface. The dies are like a big cookie cutter. They're sharp on the interior edge. The simplest ones only cut the outline. This one has hole punches as well to cut the holes on the corners of the holster for mounting the belt loop. With this method you get exact same every time and not only are you getting the consistency of the shape but as the die goes through the leather the shearing action compresses the edges and when we get to beveling and slicking and dressing up the edge it makes it a lot easier than something that's hand cut. And then for the top band and body shield on this we also have a die which as you can see makes that very lovely pressed edge the next step is in dressing the edges first thing we use the groover this is not structural it's just I think a grooved edge is more attractive than an edge left plain. And later when I'm getting ready to stitch, it also makes a guideline for my stitcher. So do you groove on just the rough side or both sides eventually? Well, I groove on the rough side because this is the side that's going to be showing. This is the outside right. of the holster. Because this is going in the waistband. Exactly. And then on the body shield, I groove the outside because it's the smooth part that will be showing there. And I also groove the inside of the shield because that's going to be standing up in full view. Now, as this leather is very, very tough, I'm going over the groove twice to deepen it. The tensile strength on this wicket leather is very good. Now I've got squared edges on both of these pieces of leather. On the clicked holster I've got the square edge only on one side because the shearing of the die rounded this side. On the hand cut holster it's square on both edges. So now we need to bevel it to get rid of the sharp edge. We've got a couple different types of bevelers. One of the most popular is the western edge beveler. It's got a deep V cutter and it's good when you're pushing straight away. It makes nice, even, rounded cuts. Get that on both sides. You don't want to take off too much and create a knife edge. Just breaking that square so that when we slick it, it'll be nicely round. Now, it's hard to use these in tight little corners because the long tines tend to gouge the leather. Tandy is currently making some very nice bevelers that have very short tines and a rounded cutting head and these work very well in tight quarters and yeah. since you're limited to how much leather you can get in that little groove you can't really overcut with these okay that's interesting now these specialized tools are you getting these all from one place or you, you have to find them in different well they're locations? sold by different distributors these are from Tandy leather factory Okay. It's proprietary to them, but they've got shops all over the country and catalog sales, okay. not hard to find. Easy to find if you search Google, I'm mm -hmm. sure. These Western bevelers you can get from Weaver Leather or many other distributors, and they're very handy, a lot of applications. Now I'm only beveling up to the point where it's going to join the body shield that covers it. I don't want to bevel past there because that would create a gap when the edges are brought together later. I see. Okay. 
on the bottom edge of these, I lightly bevel, what I call defuzzing it, just so there's no hairy edge showing. And then I use a heavier bevel, just use the knife on the little inside cut there, a heavier bevel on the inside to give it more rounded edge. Okay, so you're just scoring it so the tool can get in. Right. It's just too tight to get the tool in that little tiny corner. So I use the tip of the knife to start it. And you can see how much I'm having to push. The grain on this leather is really dense. Now being the hand cut piece, I have to bevel this on both sides. Whereas I only needed to do one side on the die cut piece. Now everything is beveled and ready to be slicked. So I'll move over here to the slicking machine. This is merely a grinder motor for which a machinist friend of mine made an aluminum arbor. And it gives me a way to power slick the edges, which reduces the amount of handwork needed to dress them up. But they need to be quite wet when you're doing this. If they get dry, the friction tends to burn it instead of slick it. Oh, another good tip. I learned to slick the edges in the direction that I'm going to apply the edge coat later on, because when I'm drawing the dauber with the edge coat on it over the leather, if the fibers are all laying down in that direction, it doesn't snag and makes a much easier application. Now, if someone didn't have this machine, how would they go about it? You could do it totally by hand. It just takes a little longer. Okay. One of the reasons I use these machines is I'm never just making one holster yeah. at a time. I might be doing 20 of these or 40 of these. Right. This is how we make it look like there's a lot of you. Exactly. The slicking machine does about an 80% job. To get the really fine, glassy, smooth, slicked edge, I then hand slick it using a couple simple tools. This is just an old big pen. Nice, smooth plastic gets into the tiny corners. And then the wooden handle of an old tool. Just go over it at a couple of different angles to get that really rounded edge. And you keep finger testing it until it feels very glassy. Now, when we're pressing down on the wet leather, it mushrooms the edges out just a little bit. So I take this piece of smooth plastic, and as a last step, I press them down to flatten it out again. And it leaves the edge hard and flat. For single layer edges that are straight, a slicking wheel works very well. Again, these are sold by Tandy and many leather craft suppliers. Basically just a pulley wheel with a smooth inside. I guess this is one of those steps you don't see or you don't often see in mass manufactured. Holsters. No, it tends to get skipped over a lot. But this is one of the things that makes really fine finished leather. When I used to do gun shows, a lot of people who didn't know a single thing about leather work would pick up a holster and you'd see their fingers just start stroking the edges. Mm -hmm. Really finely finished edges are one of the marks of well done yeah. leather work. Now sometimes if my leather is somewhat grainy, after I press it, I'll go over it again. Because I want to get it to that very glassy point. There we are. Is there a huge difference in the amount of material you're using for a smaller gun? Like, this is the Glock 43. Is, is there a big difference? Not an enormous amount, really. If, as you see, 
It's about two-thirds the bulk of the larger SIG holster, and the tops are largely the same. Yeah, okay. More a matter of just what we're shaping it for. Right. With a leather holster, the material involved is kind of a minor consideration on cost. The difference of an inch of leather between a short and a long barrel isn't all that great cost-wise. It's the time that it takes to put together and how much of a pain it is, which has a great deal of effect on the final cost. Now I'm marking my gluing lines. I line the edge of the leather up and then I push it up slightly so that the line I trace at the bottom is going to be hidden by the leather going over it when it's actually assembled. And that's the same for the inside line from mark here. And that shows me where I should not go with the glue. Because if the glue gets on the face of the leather, the finish, whatever color you put on, won't take there. It'll be a big bald spot. Now these are the steel reinforcement pieces that I put inside the top of the holster. Okay. This is what holds it open when I want to reholster. Uh, the pressure of the belt will collapse a soft holster. So okay. at the reinforced edge, it creates a mouth that stays open. Okay. Brush a little glue on the leather and on the metal and give that a moment to get tacky. So this is something here I think that um, that's uh, people who are into kydex for example and they think with leather you don't have this kind of form but you do because it's still reinforced here. Exactly it requires a reinforcement because leather by its nature is pliable. Right. But so it's a good thing to see for, to show you the difference and that there is still structure in the leather. Oh exactly. And in fact, there's another piece of steel that goes in later after we've bent the holster and we brought the edges together, which keeps the back flange rigid where the belt loop attaches. And also, by being stiff, it creates what I call a torque plate, that when the belt goes over it, pulls inward. The pressure of the belt, the torque, transfers to the butt of the gun, so it presses in against my side. The end of the handle is the hardest part on any weapon to hide. Now that the glue is tacky, I can place the steel reinforcement where it needs to go and have it actually stay in place. I have to be careful about putting these in there that I don't get too close to an edge where I'm going to stitch because while my stitcher is very good, asking it to sew through metal is going quite a long way out of its design parameters. Now I put the glue on each side because it's contact cement, which largely sticks to itself. Being careful not to get glue out on the edge that will be exposed, because again, that will interfere with the finish. Now the glue that we use here is a product called barge cement, which is very, very strong but it also has to be used only in ventilated conditions. It's got a lot of nasty chemicals in it. Don't use it in a closed up room or any place where you don't have full ventilation. I usually have a big fan going if I'm doing a lot of gluing to force the air out. A lot of places won't sell it in large amounts. Many of the leather supplies, you just get it in little two ounce tubes smaller containers. And here is why we traced on the guidelines for the gluing. Because I'm not good at guessing. There we are. We let that get tacky. Then we can assemble it for sanding. Now that the glue has had time to get tacky, we can assemble them. It's easiest to start at one edge and kind of feel it around with the fingers to keep the edges even. You don't want to have a lot of overlap that you have to carve off later. And then to really set the glue, I use this dead blow hammer on my little shop anvil.
Same technique. Line it up, squeeze it together, make sure everything's even. And so everything you do here it in is place. the same. Um, the differences are the punching out or right on the production holsters being that they're die cut they're much faster to cut out and they're easier to go together because everything is automatically even because the dies were made to fit one another on the totally handmade holster it's a bit coarser i have to spend more time evening it up and dressing the edges so it's time factor now that they're put together before i stitch them i have to make sure the edges are all lined up and straight so it's off to the belt sander Because of the size of the big belt sander, I can't get into the little corners with it. So back inside the shop, I'll use the spindle sander to true those up before I stitch. The spindle sander is made out of an old drill press with a couple of sanding drums set on a screw and just tightened together with a nut. But it makes a wonderful little spindle to get into the tight places that I can't reach with the big sander. Prior to this, I would have had to do it by hand with a knife, and that is tedious. So here, an amateur can just use something like a Dremel oh, tool? A or... Dremel, or you can just pair it with a knife. This is good for production, because as I said, I'm never only doing one holster at a time. Right. Now we groove them, and off to the stitcher. Now we're grooving which gives me the guide for where I want to be running in the stitches. And it also helps the stitches sit below flush so they're not up high to get worn off. And where I can't groove, I make a little pencil guide for my stitching so I don't run into the metal on the inside because that has a shocking quality to it and I have done it. I'd prefer to avoid that. Now they're ready to sew. Next up is the stitching which is done on these hundred year old Landis machines, old saddle making machines. They're absolutely the Cadillac for this type of work. It's got an awl that comes down and makes the hole. The needle then sews up through the hole from below, catches the thread in its hook, takes it down and locks the stitch. So it can do very heavy materials very evenly. But you do want to watch your fingers with this thing. Yes, with the very heavy leather, sometimes the needle wants to bind, so you have to sort of encourage it through the hole. the very pointy blade to trim the threads because it can get down in the hole and not leave any frayed ends sticking out. Now that the edges have been sanded true and sewn together, they're all square, so they need to be beveled. 
I do the heaviest bevel on the inside. I want a very rounded edge there because it's creating sort of the funnel for the end of the slide when it goes in. And if I leave a very square edge, it can catch. So I use a larger beveler for the inside, making sure the material is rolled over nicely. And on the outside, again, I just start the bevel with the knife because it's such a tight, tight corner. Round the leather off there. And I just come back here so there isn't a pointy, fuzzy bit on the end. This type of holster, I'm probably doing 20 or 30 at the at same, same time. time. Both okay. hand cut and clicked out. Mm -hmm. Whatever's on the production run for that month, just wow. done as a group. Okay. Now that they're beveled, it's back to the slicking machine to start getting that smooth edge. Wet the edges down very well. Now they're ready for hand slicking and pressing the edges before bending. Here's another place where our little pen comes in handy. Getting into that tight corner at the junction of the body shield and the top. And then I use the wooden tool in a three angle motion, sort of rolling the edge by degrees. I flatten it on the top and I also come to the outside and the inside. And I find it's much easier to get a good slick on the pieces that have been clicked because the shearing action of the die compresses the fibers on the edge of the leather and makes it simpler to get everything compacted and laying down together. Right. Now that the edges are done, I'm going to glue in the reinforcing steel. This is what I spoke of earlier as creating the torque plate. It's a flat piece of spring steel with a hole for the hardware to pass through. And it gets glued in place before we bend everything. Just as in gluing in the steel for the top reinforcement, put a little glue on the leather, a little glue on the metal, so it will hold in place and not shift when I'm trying to stitch it. Now that our glue is tacky, place the torque plate metal in here, giving myself enough room to stitch around because as I said before, hitting the steel with the sewing machine is a jarring experience. Now, we need to bring these edges of the holster together, but we've got a problem. There's a piece of steel in here, which makes normal bending a bit tough. Therefore, specialized equipment comes into play. First, I wet the leather on both sides to make it malleable and able to stretch and bend. And the same friend who made the spindle for my slicking machine turned me out this little arbor which I can use as a bending post to bring the edges together and control the shape for the top of the gun that it's going to fit. Now both the SIG and the Glock have somewhat squared off slides. 
If it were a 1911, I would just bend it around this. But as it's square edged, I do it in two different bends to give myself more of a box shape. I'm wetting it across the top, and then I wet it down the center where the crease is going to be. A lot of this you just do by feel. You know about the width of the slide that's going to go in there, and roughly where to place the bends on the arbor. And most of that just comes from doing. Now they're ready to glue together and stitch. Now, I just freehand this with the glue because I've done them for so very long I know exactly the stitching pattern that's going to go in there. You may, if you wish, draw in, again, a gluing line pattern so you don't go over where you want the sticky to be. Either method will work. Now that the glue has gotten tacky, again we can bring the edges together, lining it up as closely as you possibly can, because the less you have to sand away, the easier it is. So I line them up, squeeze them together, and then set it with the dead blow hammer. Again, on the die-cut ones, it's so much easier because they're absolutely perfectly even from the get-go. On the hand-cut, sometimes I have to bend and twist a little to make things line up. Now I'll give those a quick sanding, just to rough them in before stitching. Now that they're all sanded and evened up, we're going to groove the edge and put the stitching pattern on there to follow. First, adjust the grooving tool to the correct size. This gives me my follow-on path for the thread. Then I take a template, line it up with the edges. This allows me to draw the stitching line on even every time. Now we're ready to sew. careful going around this corner because this is the closest I come to the steel on the inside. I'm just skirting the edge of it. It doesn't pay to go too fast right there. Okay, Sam, so on the subject of uh, sewing leather, right. for the amateur out there that doesn't have a machine like this, what quick advice can you give? Well, I sewed for years in the early days with a hand stitching awl. Okay. These are available wow. through the leather supply houses. Mm -hmm. This one I like very much has a bobbin that goes inside the handle. The thread then feeds out through the needle. You pre-punch your holes in your workpiece, put this through, and when you pull it back it creates a loop. You have a separate piece of thread in your other hand which you feed through the loop, and when you pull it tight, it creates that lock stitch inside. Each okay. stitch is individually held. Okay, and that's called a hand stitching awl? A hand stitching awl, yes.
Now, as before, when I trim the thread, I want to use my pointy knife to get right down in the hole and not leave any fuzzy bits coming out. It just looks cleaner when you don't have ragged ends. Now, when you stitch and that big, powerful presser foot hammers up and down on it, sometimes it shifts the leather just a little bit. So before I bevel it, I go back to the spindle sander and I give it just a little truing up. Now we need to take the square edges off of this part where we've sewn. So again, the beveler. For this one, the western beveler is a good fit because it's long, straight edges. I do it off the edge of the table because since this has the steel in it, it tends to rock when it's on the flat. So by putting it off the edge, it allows me to hold flat the part I'm actually cutting on and not have to struggle with it. Now they're ready to go for their final slicking. As before with the slicker, want them really, really wet. Run them through and get those edges rounded out. And now back to hand slick them and to be finally ready for molding. As before, the wooden tool works very well on this outside edge. Hit it from a couple of angles. Get that nice rounding effect. Flatten it out. And you can see from the sheen how it's gotten very packed down and hardened along the edge. There, like a mirror. One more step I forgot to mention. You've got to sign your work. So, using my clicker table as an anvil, that's where I put on the stamp. I place the stamp on the wet leather, and again I use a dead blow hammer because it does not bounce. And it gives me a very good impression. In order to mold the holsters, they have to be thoroughly wet. Now, you can dampen it with a sponge. I just prefer to dunk them. It gets it very, very wet. Don't leave it in too long. You don't want it mushy. Now that they're wet and malleable, I use my thumbs inside to open it up a bit. Sometimes, if it's tight, I'll take a block of wood to stretch it out somewhat before I place the dummy of the weapon inside. This one is for a large frame SIG 220 or 226. You want to get it seated all the way so that the trigger guard shape is right down to the bottom of the pocket. If it's reluctant to go in, Using these dummy guns, you can persuade them. I wouldn't do that with the real ones, but that's the beauty of these aluminum dummies. You can beat on them all day long. Now, just real quick, do you want to tell us where you get the aluminum dummies from? These are from the good people at Duncan's Customs up in Bay City, Michigan. They do beautiful work. They make many of these gun models with high detail. It's an absolute godsend for holster makers. I don't have to worry about rust or scratches. I can beat on them, pry on them. I can bake the holster with the dummy inside if I need to. I use the screwdriver to open this up because I want to put a dowel down the front to create a tunnel for the front sight. So once I've pried it open, I take my tapered dowel, I get it lined up, and then utilizing the infamous wax stick, I persuade it into position. It's running all the way up. 
repeating the same process with our little block. To make sure everything's even, not sloped off to one side or the other. And then open it up for the sight channel. Now at this point it is possible just to hand mold them, but again since I'm doing so many at once I take the step of squeezing it in a molding press which makes a lot less work for my hands and arms. Now the molding press is a hydraulic press and I have layered rubber top and bottom. I put a piece of pure gum rubber which has no color in it that can transfer to the leather over, creating a big sandwich into the press and start pumping. This is how you get the big modules, right? <laughs> A workout every day. <laughs> now it will sit in there under pressure for four or five minutes. It's actually duration rather than pounds per square foot that gives it the shape. And then when it comes out, it'll be ready for the fine touch of hand molding. And then it's all over by the drying. They've been in about four or five minutes. It's time to release them. And see how well it's done. Now we could dry them and use them as they are. You can see the shape of the gun is pressed in, but it just doesn't look pretty enough yet. So we're going to bone them. Originally pieces of antler and bone were used for this, so the term boning came into being. I used some shaped pieces of wood, but the effect is very much the same. These two tools mold all my holsters. If you've gotten any of my holsters in the past couple of decades, they were probably molded with these. One, the flat beaver tail-like shape, is good for doing outlines and also for turning in corners and defining those shapes. And then I can use the flat of it to press down. And what we're doing is we're defining the shape of the weapon that's inside. You really need to instinctively know the lines of the gun to know where to press, what to highlight. Glocks are dead easy because Gaston made all the lines straight. We're very, very grateful in the holster world. Doesn't hurt to use a straight edge, almost like you're using a ruler. And the gun shape will start to emerge from the leather. To sharpen it up, I use this more needle-pointed piece of wood to get the deep creases. And then repeating the process on the face side. On the holsters, I define the shape of the ejection port but a Glock has an extremely sharp, sharp edge on the metal of the ejection port, so you can't leave that part pressed in deeply, because when the holster is dry, it can actually catch and make the gun difficult to withdraw. So after I'm done with the molding, and I take the dummy gun out, I reach inside to the finger and I push that leather back up. The outline will remain for looks, but it won't grab onto the weapon and prevent the draw. I come in here and just give it a little twist to relieve the slide release area. Push out the leather there for the ejection port. So now our little Glock fits perfectly. Sometimes I go back and I just give the edges a rub in case they've gotten 
roughed up with handling. Now it's ready to go out in the sun and dry for a day or two prior to finishing. The process for the SIG is the very same, just larger. Although the SIG has a lot more dips and angles and shapes, not as simple as the Glock on its topography. We want to define the sight track very well because once the leather is dried, this sight track needs to be tented up and fairly rigid. In case somebody is using night sights or high profile, high visibility sights, they need room to move. You don't want them dragging. Is the 226 a common gun for you to build holsters for? Most of the SIGs are pretty frequently ordered. 226, 220, 239, the SIG family is very, very popular. And of course, I build for all of the different ones. That new 938 has come in for a lot of orders lately. As you can see, the Glock shape was a great deal easier. Yeah, that's very obvious from <laughs> yeah. a lot more work here. Uh, the, the worst to do are revolvers because you've got a lot of different shapes. At least with an auto, it's pretty well flat planes, even though it may be divided by you know, different grooves. But doing cylinders and frames, trigger guards on revolvers, takes a good deal more time. same tools when you're doing revolvers? Very same tools. These two tools do everything. And now we have the boning accomplished, both the holsters. The last thing I do is I use my tiny little number stamps here to put in the impression for what weapon it's going to fit. Because who knows how many hands it will pass through and years down the line, somebody may need to know what the heck goes in this holster. So 226, it's a dead giveaway. Okay, so anyone who comes across one of your holsters, they can just look, do you always put it in the same place? Yes, usually on the back, right below the maker's mark. And a four, and a three, and our Glock is marked. There we are. Now that our holsters have been boned and dried, they've spent a day or two in the sun on each side, getting the water out, they're ready for finishing. You could just color it, but I like to do an edge coat. Not only does it make a pretty two-tone effect, but this is a flexible enamel and it keeps the fibers locked down. A lot of leather will get rough and hairy on the edges with working and use. This seals it and prevents that happening. There's a number of companies making the edge coat products. I mix a couple different ones because I was not really happy with any single one. And this gives me a very dark and very smooth, thinner mixture so that when it dries, it has a nice hard, glossy edge. There, now it's edge coated, it goes back on the peg to dry. About five or ten minutes, that will be ready for the oil.
There, now everybody is edge coated and ready for color once dry. Now that the edges are dry, nice and hard and slick, we're going to give them their color. I use a Neats Foot Oil compound, which gives it that beautiful russet brown color. And the oil also has the property of making the leather sweat proof and waterproof. So it's a finish that I like very much, especially for here in Florida, where perspiration is a way of life. The one thing to be very careful of with Neats Foot Oil is not to overdo. Less is more when it comes to the oil and it's better to do a couple of light coats than to try and really drown it. Because if you over oil the leather, it will turn into a greasy dish rag and it will never recover. So just enough is perfect, too much is disastrous. So what maintenance do you need to do with these? You really don't need to do any maintenance with the oil finished leather. It goes in there and it's there forever and it keeps the water and perspiration out. So I've got some of these I made 25 years back that are as flexible as the day I made them. And I have sweated buckets over these things. So it's a very excellent finish for all kinds of leather. Now the last step is to give them their sealant, their final coating. It's a product called acrylic resiline. And I find it's best to put it on with an airbrush. You can use a dauber, but you can see some streaks from the dauber, if you want to apply it that way. With the airbrush, I get a very fine misting coat. And it keeps me from overdoing it. That gives it a soft shine when it dries and helps to further seal and waterproof the leather. Doesn't take a lot, just one even coat, and it'll dry in about five minutes. I do take care when I'm done to blow out the pieces of the airbrush you don't want to let this stuff dry inside. <laughs> it was set up like cement. Got to get all the little apertures clear. The live final step in these is to assemble the belt loop. These come with two of the three belt loop sizes. There's an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half, and an inch and three quarter. Two come with each holster. They mount on a locking swivel. There's a tooth washer that goes in between the holster and the strap. The screw goes through the middle of that and it acts as the swivel connection. When the swivel is loose, you can change the angle to whatever pitch that you want the holster to ride at. And once you have it where you like, Tighten the holster screw down, and once it's tightened down in place, it won't move, it stays at that angle. These snaps are directional snaps. They have a little locking lip on the bottom edge of the socket. This prevents it from being able to be pulled open from the belt from the inside. To snap them, you catch the bottom edge first under the edge of the stud, and then they fold up and snap in place. To open it, you just peel down from the top like any snap, but it has to fold up from the bottom to engage the locking aspect. Okay, so on these, what you want to do is leave, have it loose, put it in the position you want, and then tighten it. Exactly. Once you tighten it down, the tooth washer between is grabbing the leather when it's under pressure, and it stays at that angle. And there we are.
McDaniels ready to wear. All right, guys, there you go. That's the how it's made on the McDaniels 2 also, mm -hmm. right, Sam? McDaniel uh, 2. One for the Glock 43 that I'm holding and one for the SIG 226. Right. Sam's holding uh, the big SIGs. 220, 226, they all fit the same. Very good. Anything else you want to add here before we go away? No, we've covered most of it. The, um, the holsters are all in the very close price range. Right. What is the price range of well, Anywhere holsters? from 105 to 125, okay. depending on if you're getting it with a body shield or a thumb brake strap okay. or just straight open top. Okay, very cool. And uh, what's the wait time like? It varies. It can be four weeks, six, eight. It depends on how many orders are on right. hand. Uh, does the season affect anything? We're headed towards Christmas right now of 2015. It doesn't really affect me all that much. Okay. I stay busy. Okay, but if you want one of these for a gift for that special someone, <laughs> I suggest you call now. <laughs> you know, and people have to call you. Yes. So yes. what's the number? It's 386-462-0576. Yeah, you have to call up Sam. He's a nice guy, won't bite your head off. I know it's unheard of today that you actually talk to the guy making something for you, but it's a great opportunity Absolutely. to get Sam's input on this it. This way I can get all the details and do it right the first time. Right, and is, there's a website as well, right? If there you is, see a catalog option. website. Okay, Andrew's Custom? Andrewsleather.com. Awesome. We actually have uh, several videos out there and one other how it's made, right? Because right? I know a lot of guys out there like the how it's made stuff. There's a lot of uh, craftsmen out there building Certainly. their own holsters. Right. Can they call you up? Absolutely. Call yeah. me directly if you have questions. Yeah. Don't slow them down because we need them to make holsters, but absolutely call them up, get some advice from him. He's a nice guy. Um, I think that's pretty much it, right? Pretty well covers it. Yeah. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Sam Andrews, Pleasure, sir. Andrews Custom Leather. Do you know how I end this stuff, Sam? You always end it the same way. Quiet peace out on that. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was, that was a little lackluster. Oh, you really? You were too mellow, both of you. Let's oh, do it one more time. We're so mellow. One more time. Yeah. One more time. I thought that was brilliant. Oh, okay. That was my best work ever. Now, she wants us to remote. Yes. 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 A little Let's more be excitement. Sexy. Should I talk? What kind of accent? I don't need any on? accents. Just yeah, man. Welcome back to the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, bonjour, that, bonjour. Uh, Voici uh, l'enster de like... de l'armée grand. <laughs> Whatever he said. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that was the outtakes. Let's do this one more time. Oh, okay. Lola. I All think right. that was pretty good. But, All right. Uh, okay. Good to go.